Hello, everyone who is just joining us. We're just um, going to wait a few seconds till everybody enters the webinar here, and uh, then we'll get started with some introductions. At least nobody had to go out in the rain today, so that's a good thing. We're, we're up to about 20 participants so far, so um, we're, we're in good shape. But I, I think I'll start with the introductions now and people can join us as they come in. My name is Leslie Lampton. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Ridgefield Library and say how wonderful it is again to be working with um, RVNA Health as co-sponsors for this program. And um, the format today is gonna to be about 30 or 40 minutes of presentations and then there'll be some time for Q&A. If you have any questions during the program, just type them into the Q&A function and we'll get to those at the end of the program. So now I am just gonna welcome Nancy Rowe, who is the Director of Marketing and public relations at RVNA Health, and she will introduce our speakers this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us, and thank you to Leslie for hosting the evening. This program was originally scheduled for the RVNA Health, Health Fair and Wellness Fair that was scheduled for April. And of course, um, April was the height of the pandemic, so we of course canceled it, but we decided that the topic was of merit enough that we should present it virtually. So thank you to the um, library for, for allowing us to do that. Um, I'd like to introduce tonight our first presenter who is Dr. John Dunleavy of Ortho, Connecticut. And Dr. Dunleavy is not only a hip and knee specialist with Ortho, Connecticut, and he is not only an exceptional surgeon, who is entirely committed to his patients, but he also was a contestant in the 2018 RVNA Health Spelling Bee. So we can tell you that Dr. Dunleavy is not only a brilliant surgeon and an excellent physician, he's also a wordsmith and a Renaissance man, and we've enjoyed a, um, a nice relationship with him in many ways. So having said that, Dr. Dunleavy. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you to uh, both everyone at uh, RVA Health and at the library for, for putting together this webinar and inviting me. Um, that, is, that is true. I was a contestant in the uh, Spelling Bee, although I'm not sure how much of a wordsmith I was since I think I'm, I was the first one knocked out. Oh. So uh, that could have gone better, I would say. Um, so I've been asked uh, to uh, talk about um, how does a patient uh, make the decision to say when they're ready uh, to have a joint replacement? And, and when I say joint replacement, I typically am talk, talking about knee and hip replacements. Those are the ones that I do. But I do think that this um, will also apply to folks thinking about shoulder or ankle or other types of uh, joint replacement surgery. Um, when, when someone comes into my office and we, we sit down and we start having a conversation about their situation, I, I think of it um, sort of like there's a checklist and we have to um, kind of go down the checklist with the patient to see, well, okay, um, are they appropriate? First of all, do they have the appropriate problem that we uh, could, could help them with a joint replacement? And have they tried um, an appropriate amount of conservative management. Um, uh, that could be something as simple as using some ibuprofen and doing some, uh, some exercise uh, to adjusting activities. And we'll speak about all of that. Um, the patient has to be medically appropriate. They have to be uh, healthy enough uh, to have such an operation. And not everyone is. Most patients are, certainly, but not everyone is. Um, and then I, I uh, try to assess how comfortable uh, the patient is, uh, both in terms of how much pain they're having and how much uh, loss of function they have, but also how comfortable are they with the decision? Because uh, it is, you know, a, a, um, a decision that you can't come back from. Once you've done the surgery to put uh, metal and plastic and ceramic uh, parts in a knee or a hip, then that cannot be undone. So it's really important that the patient be comfortable 
um, with that decision and also um, comfortable with, with their interaction with me and on every level. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, so uh, achieving that comfort level for the patient, I think we have to have um, this uh, thorough discussion to make sure that they understand what the problem is and what their options are and then the solutions we have to offer. And in the end, I always explain to them that these surgeries are not um, surgeries that we uh, undertake lightly, uh, but that ultimately they are elective, meaning that the patient has to make a personal decision about whether or not um, it's the right move for them. And of course, I'm there to help with that decision making. So the first thing I do is make sure that the patient has the correct uh, problem to make sure that we can really help them. Um, <clears throat> the vast majority of the time we're dealing with um, arthritis. And when I say that, I mean uh, degenerative arthritis most of the time, as opposed to rheumatoid arthritis or other types. Um, when a, a hip or a knee becomes arthritic, even simple uh, common activities can be very painful. Even just walking, getting up uh, into or out of uh, uh, a chair or a car. Um, and in particular with hip problems, it can be difficult to bend down to put on shoes or socks. Um, and, and it can get uh, difficult climbing stairs in particular with knee trouble. Um, sometimes the problem gets so advanced that the joint can bother the patient even while they are at rest. Um, so what are we talking about? What is OA or osteoarthritis? That's the most common form of arthritis and uh, often referred to as wear and tear arthritis. Um, <clears throat> there are any number of reasons this can happen, uh, but uh, no matter what the cause is, whether it's a genetic or something that occurs because of overuse, the joint will eventually become eroded um, and uneven and painful because the normal healthy cartilage, which we're all born with that acts as a cushion, uh, essentially wears away. Um, and uh, when that happens, uh, bone spurs will form um, and the joint can become deformed as a result. Um, and uh, it then uh, loses its ability to uh, move through a full arc of motion, um, uh, that it, the, the arc of motion that it once had, uh, the joint. So this is something that can be improved ultimately by doing an operation to um, put a new joint in and um, sort of resurface the joint to make uh, the common daily activities um, that can become very painful, uh, less painful. Um, now, I said there were several causes. It can be from excessive wear. There can be uh, can have been injuries involved, such as uh, high impact uh, activity that's repetitive. Um, also, this uh, is not uh, a disease of the young. Um, I have to say it is affecting more and more people in their 40s and 50s these days. Um, but it tends uh, to occur as we age, uh, but not in everyone, and certainly not in everyone to the same extent. Uh, it does tend to occur uh, more in heavier patients, um, and um, it can also come from uh, activities related to work or even uh, accidents uh, that will eventually cause uh, the, the joint and the bones around the joint to deform. Um, so we start out uh, always with non-surgical options. Uh, what are we talking about? Some are extremely simple, like um, modifying a person's lifestyle somewhat. An example of that would be if um, a patient is having a lot of difficulty with uh, a fairly aggressive activity, such as running, uh, where moving to a, a low impact or non-impact uh, type of uh, exercise, such as biking um, or swimming, might really make uh, the difference and may uh, get that patient to a point where they're uh, comfortable enough with their joint that they don't feel they need an operation. Uh, bringing down a patient's weight or certainly keeping uh, in good shape is also very important and um, uh, physical therapy uh, may be helpful. So I will tend to write a physical therapy prescription for uh, almost everyone. Um, a lot of times patients are able to do exercise on their own um, and simple things such as yoga and stretching and, uh, and walking um, can, be, uh, can be adequate for some, some people. Um, 
simple medicine uh, like ibuprofen and Aleve, which is uh, uh, anti-inflammatory medicine that's non-steroidal and you can take uh, right over the counter, uh, sometimes can be very effective and it's certainly reasonable tr to try that. Um, once that loses its uh, efficacy uh, to a certain degree, especially if a patient has a, a significant flare up of pain in a knee or hip joint, we can try uh, an injection. Um, typically, we start out with a steroid injection, um, such as cortisone. That's uh, it's very common. Um, ten, I do anywhere from five to 10 of those a day, believe it or not, in my office. Um, and then um, slightly less common, but still um, something that we might try are what are called hyaluronic acid injections, which is sort of a a cushioning type of injection of a synthetic um, substance that uh, the natural substance of which we all have in our joint fluid. Um, and the synthetic version is made, believe it or not, from chickens. Um, and we inject that into knee joints uh, quite frequently. It's not approved for hips and it, it's um, uh, ability to help knee arthritis is somewhat uh, in question but it's something to talk about, certainly. Um, exercise and weight control um, are critical. Uh, it's been shown uh, that exercise and uh, keeping one's weight under control is some of the best uh, ways to treat this kind of problem. Exercise will decrease pain and will improve uh, someone's flexibility. Um, and uh, keeping to a healthy diet can certainly facilitate losing weight and keeping a person's weight under control. And then. Uh, therefore, putting less stress on uh, your joints. Um, we already mentioned some of the medicines. Uh, people also uh, try Tylenol. And I highlighted narcotics here. Um, narcotics are highlighted because that's really not something that we would typically use uh, to treat <clears throat> arthritic joints. I think if you get to a point where you're needing narcotic pain medicine to treat your pain, it, you really should seriously consider surgery at that stage. Uh, there are some uh, effective topical pain relieving creams and sprays such as um, something known as Voltaren gel. And I've heard uh, patients even say that some of the uh, CBD creams uh, are, can be very effective. And I think that's reasonable. Okay, so uh, patient then says to me, okay, you know, Dr. Dunleavy, I've tried everything. It's not working or it's not working well enough. Now, what do I do at this point? So the basic question uh, for a patient to ask is, uh, am I satisfied with where I am? Am I satisfied with how my knee or my hip feels and my level of function? And if the answer is no, they're not satisfied, then we start talking about surgical options. Um, hip replacements, we'll start there and I'll, I'll go through the slides fairly quickly. Uh, hip replacements have been around for a while now, uh, first performed in 1960, and I agree with the statement from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons that a hip replacement has been one of the most important surgical advances uh, of the previous century. Uh, there have been many improvements, uh, even in just the last few years, in design and techniques, which I'll touch on. Um, and these days, uh, hip replacements are more effective, and they last longer, and I think it's fair to say that the um, surgery uh, is a little easier on patients to tolerate uh, than it used to be. And it's a huge number of these done every year. Uh, I'm not sure if that 400,000 number is even accurate. I think it may be higher than that. So what should a person expect? Well, they should expect a dramatic reduction in pain. Um, and that's, uh, that's not an exaggeration. It should be impressive and immediate, uh, the reduction in pain, and an improvement in their ability to perform uh, common activities. Um, so patients will often ask, well, what can I do and what can't I do? What do I have to avoid? And um, this is kind of a fun slide that's uh, on the, the left of the screen. That's the first President Bush uh, jumping out of an airplane. I believe it was for his 80th birthday and he had uh, already had uh, at least one of his hips replaced. So I kind of had that up there as a joke because um, one of the things you would say to avoid would be high impact activities like jumping out of an airplane, for instance, or a contact sport. But, you know, what can you still do? You can almost do everything. I mean, uh, there's very little that a person really can't do. Uh, patients that I have, they ski, they bike, they even run, although that sometimes can be difficult. Um, these days, I think it's reasonable to say that a, a, a hip replacement 
should last about 25, 30 years. Um, and that has to do with uh, that improvement uh, compared to years gone by when more than 10 years ago, it probably, the answer to that question probably would have been about 15 years or so, 10 years. Uh, there have been improvements in particular in the uh, piece of plastic that's put in. Um, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene is the, uh, the, uh, the plastic that goes in there, not in every case, but in most cases. And it's uh, been engineered uh, to a point where now it's, it's lasting a very long time. So we're not really sure how long they'll last, but they should last a very long time. Um, the uh, surgery, there are different techniques involved. Uh, first of all, there are total replacements. There are partial replacements. There are other things with a hip called hip resurfacing surgeries. And there are different techniques such as minimally invasive surgery. Um, total hip replacement refers to a surgery where the entire hip joint, ball and socket um, are being um, uh, redone. Um, so you'll see here what the implants look like. There's a metal stem there that is inserted into the upper part of the thigh bone, which is called the femur. And there's a metal socket piece that's um, uh, inserted into the, uh, the opening in the pelvis, uh, which is for the, the socket opening called the acetabulum. And then there's uh, typically a piece of plastic that's placed inside that socket piece. And then that ball piece that uh, is either made out of usually metal or more commonly these days, a ceramic substance. Um, and when you put it all together and you take an x-ray, it looks sort of like that. Um, this, can, uh, this is not something that can be done through uh, arthroscopic surgery, but um, the, uh, this slide shows that um, a minimally invasive approach has changed the size of the incision dramatically over the course of uh, even just the last maybe 10 years. Uh, the instruments have been improved and we are now able to do the surgery through a fairly small incision that would be uh, outlined by that blue line you see. Um, it is important to point out though that the incision uh, will be as big as it needs to be uh, so that we can accomplish the surgery safely and of course as small as it can be. It is possible that these smaller incisions will make the rehabilitation slightly shorter than they once were, but it should be pointed out that the minimally invasive surgery has not been proven uh, to show improved overall outcomes eventually. Um, so uh, I, I always say this, if I could do hip replacements all day, I would. And the reason I say that is because when asked after four years how satisfied they were, patients uh, said that they were very satisfied and would have surgery again if they had it to do over again at a huge rate, about 96% of it, which is just incredible. Um, and Regis Philbin, uh, the late Regis Philbin is on there uh, because he was one of those uh, very satisfied patients. Unfortunately, knee replacements are not uh, quite as well tolerated. Uh, they tend to be more difficult for patients. And I think that that has to do with the complexity of the joint. Um, so basically you're resurfacing an arthritic knee joint with metal and plastic pieces as would be depicted by this slide. Um, sometimes the term total knee replacement can give patients um, the wrong idea. Sometimes they think you're gonna cut out their whole knee, but actually you're not, you're gonna resurface it with those pieces so they don't have bone rubbing against bone anymore. Uh, there have been some advances. There's what's called patient-specific knee replacement where uh, the patient will get an MRI beforehand and a, uh, uh, these cutting guides that are depicted in the cartoon are made for their unique anatomy to help us during the surgery. Um, uh, and that allows the surgery to be done through a smaller incision with less trauma and hopefully then less pain and a quicker recovery. And also the minimally invasive technique depicted here that um, avoids cutting into the tendon um, above the kneecap. Uh, that's also something that can uh, speed up the recovery. And this is uh, at this point something I do on just about every single knee replacement. Uh, partial knee replacements are um, knee replacements that only resurface one element of the knee. There are basically three different uh, parts of the knee that we talk about, the inner part and the outer and then under the kneecap. And this has been increasing in popularity. Um, there is less surgery involved 
and the patients after these surgeries, when it's appropriate, will tell you that their knee feels more like a normal knee than a total knee replacement knee because you haven't removed any ligaments um, where you would have to remove ligaments in a total knee replacement. These are those three parts of the knee and these are some x-rays depicting how any of those parts can be resurfaced individually. Um, we're using robots uh, quite frequently and um, uh, this I think now brings us to the most up-to-date um, modern sort of technology that's out there. Uh, this technology, I believe, is here to stay. And what the uh, robotic technology does is it allows those pieces that you, I just showed you the pictures of to be placed in the knee or the hip um, with more accuracy than in the past and to help with balancing of knee and hip joints um, to a much higher degree than we uh, used to be able to do. And I do think that this will make a significant difference, um, you know, in how patients will do and how their joints function. Uh, at this point, it's not possible to say what that importance is uh, because it just hasn't been out long enough. But uh, early studies uh, showing the outcomes of robotic assisted surgery are very um, uh, impressive so far. And so we've just, uh, my, my group uh, has just invested um, and we, uh, we just got one of these robots for our surgery center uh, where we can perform what's called uh, makoplasty. And that's because the robot is called the Mako robot. Um, and without getting too bogged down into the details, uh, essentially the, um, uh, the robot allows us to plan exactly where we want those pieces to go before we start operating. And it uh, then allows us to remove just enough bone to uh, facilitate that surgery and make it come out uh, in the best possible way. That's what the arm of the robot looks like. Um, it's important to point out the robot does not operate on people. Um, I operate on people. The robot is just a tool, but it is a very effective tool. And it helps us both with knee and hip replacements. This is a, a cartoon depiction of how the uh, robotic arm is used to help us during a hip replacement to place uh, the pieces um, more accurately. So these days, after surgery, uh, you, the patient will be sent to the recovery area uh, and they start physical therapy straight away. Now, in the past, uh, when we were doing these more in the hospital, um, they'd be there anywhere from one to three days. And I certainly still do a significant portion of the surgeries at the hospital, but uh, we've gone to doing more and more outpatient joint replacement where there's um, no need to go to the hospital at all. And we use the same surgical techniques, but in our surgery center setting. Um, and I think that the advance that sort of has allowed us to do this more than anything, more than the minimally invasive techniques, more than the robot, really has to do with the anesthesia and the, and the um, impressive advances of anesthesia that have occurred really in just the last two or three years. Um, they are now able to get patients to a point where they have um, a low enough degree of pain where they can get up immediately. And I mean like in the recovery room and walk around. Um, at our surgery center, um, patients will have the surgery, recover right there in uh, the surgery center. And after about you know four or five hours uh, or so, uh, on average, they get in the car and they go home. And our partners at RVNA Health have been uh, so helpful uh, and then in helping us um, rehab these patients where they come out to the patient's house a lot of times before surgery and certainly the same day and after surgery to check on them to make sure they're doing well and to help them start their rehabilitation. Um, we do have now a, a, cap a capability of keeping patients overnight for 23 hours um, if it's appropriate. Um, but I have to say, I think most patients will just go home that same day. Uh, so this is really, you know, the most uh, up-to-date um, sort of uh, technique that we're, we're using. And I'm really excited about it because I think this is the future of joint replacement. Um, this slide shows the growth of our program. We, we started doing just a, a, a smattering of joint replacements uh, as an outpatient case back in 15, back in 2015. And um, 
uh, we've steadily increased ever since. And here we are in 2020, already up to just about 100 cases. And that, keep in mind that that is um, having had a uh, several month period where we did none because of the pandemic. Uh, so um, uh, with that, I will stop talking um, and I will invite, I will stop sharing my screen and I will invite Gigi Weiss of RVNA Health to come in and um, speak to us about uh, some of the rehabilitation elements uh, involved with getting uh, over a joint replacement. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dunleavy, I appreciate it. Let me just um, get to where I'm going here. Um, thanks again, Dr. Dunleavy. Um, you know, we're, we're really excited to be a part of this and thanks to the um, library for, for allowing us to, to sh show you how we can uh, help you with, with everything. Um, so knowing when to say when. So a lot of the, what Dr. Dunleavy um, went over, I'm just going to kind of reiterate because we see this all the time. The existence of chronic pain in the joint. Um, and as he said, you're regularly taking painkillers uh, to deal with the pain. Uh, the pain keeps you up at night, you, despite use of just general medications. The pain is difficult um, when you're just walking or bending over. Uh, it really doesn't have any relief when you're um, during, during rest or, or, or at night. Um, the other thing is doing de you know, regular tasks, just like putting on your socks, putting on your shoes, uh, you know, getting up from a chair, going up and down stairs is usually a big indicator that, that, you're, that there's um, issues that you need to deal with. As far as um, you know, some balance, you're having some balance issues standing on one leg. Uh, other things is just general stiffness. If you're feeling stiffness in the joint, the knee or the hip isn't, isn't uh, moving like it used to, you are not able to, to get in that chair as easily. So all those kind of daily things, you're just kind of feeling in the jo joint. And sometimes you just feel emotionally worn down. You don't, you know, and, and when you're starting to feel that way where it's really affecting your sleep and affecting you emotionally, you know, you might be getting closer to, to you know, saying, saying when. Um, so some pre-surgical uh, options uh, that we were discussing is, um, you know, general exercise, like, like we said, just it has you know, great benefits, of course, um, uh, you know, a directed physical therapy also may be able to prolong the need for surgery. A lot of times uh, with the physical therapy, it actually, we, we, um, we get to a point where the uh, therapy is not able to help. And that's when we say, you know what, this is the time to go back to your surgeon and, and, and let him uh, do his thing. So um, the good thing is, is if you, you have had sur um, therapy prior to your surgery, it, there is studies that show that that the uh, recovery is much less, um, 20, uh, 29% um, less, that, that there's a significant cost savings because of the recovery is less. So, um, and it, there's a shortened time. So the, the therapy is beneficial to keep you going for a little bit longer. And also if you eventually do have surgery, it helps with your um, recovery. So knowing when to say when. So even after all you've, you've tried all these non-surgical options um, and it's, you're still in pain, you're still up at night and, and uh, you, you're having the, the, the strain and stress of, on the joint, you're still in pain. So, so you, you, may need, you may need surgery. So um, that's, that's where we can help at our VNA Health. We partner with, um, with the doctors um, and it, once Dr. Dunleavy or, or anyone else in the, the practice determines that you need the surgery, what, we have a nice seamless intake process where they send us the referral. And a lot of times uh, patients are worried about what happens after surgery. So what we do um, is we do a, an on-site home safety eval. So uh, especially for those same day surgeries, uh, we, we absolutely go out to the patient's home. We do a full evaluation. It's done by a, a 
PT or an OT, we determine, we, and we, we um, you know, see the stairs, we see how you're entering the home, where you're sleeping, where your bathroom is, where your kitchen is, what chairs you'll be sitting on, what, you know, where you should sit, where you shouldn't sit. So we kind of go through this whole process uh, with the patient so that they feel safe and they feel comfortable and, and, and more relaxed about coming home directly. Uh, so, we, so we do that for all of the on-site um, uh, on same-day surgeries. We also, uh, a lot of times, as Dr. Dunleavy mentioned, they do the surgeries in the, in the, in the hospital. Uh, with those, we do a phone assessment, determine uh, whether we will need to do an on-site assessment. And we ask, all, we ask those questions. Uh, you know, who you're going home with, what car, because uh, the hospital stay is now generally, you know, between one day, one, an overnight to, to two days. Um, and again, we're, we're, we just kind of assess the, and, and ask questions and see, determine if we need to do an on-site uh, eval. And if we do, then we will absolutely um, go out and do an on-site eval uh, with, with the patient and, and assure them that they're safe and comfortable to go home. So post-surgical care, you know, the old days was, was uh, short, short-term rehab. So just kind of going through, you know, kind of the differences, um, you know, the, in, the, in, the, in the past, you go from hospital to short-term rehab, to home care, to outpatient, but, but you know, in the, but now we're, we're kind of tending towards the home care. So you know, short-term rehab is very ex expensive. It's, it's a high risk of infection, uh, a higher risk, I should say, of infection. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're more exposed to the community. You know, it does have the 24-hour support there. There is 24-hour medical oversight at, at short-term rehab. Um, and sometimes people need that, or, or the family needs a respite stay. So um, it's, it, 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 those are one of the, the reasons why people had chosen to go to short-term rehab. But of course, home health um, is much less expensive, much more low risk um, of infection. Uh, you know, limited community exposure, you know, you're in, people love to recover in their own bed and in, in their own home, uh, which is, which is important. There's this family support. Um, and then you also have the home, the home health, home health support. And then um, the outcomes that we've, we've found over the last five years are the exact same, if not better, when people are recovering in their, in their own home. And of course, these days, there's a less COVID um, risk. So the home health um, tends to be uh, much more um, where, we're, where we're leading and we found that the, the outcomes are the same. So home health care, if you do need um, the surgery, the nurse, as Dr. Dunleavy explained, uh, they, the surgery is done that morning. Our nurse will meet the patient in that afternoon. Usually, you know, they go home about two, three, four o'clock. Our nurses are there within the hour of arriving home if you have it done at the at the surgical center. If you if surgery is done at the hospital, sometimes we they don't need the nurses, so just the therapist comes um, will come the next day. So the um, so in both cases, the the therapist will be there the next day after, after coming home. Um, and when you're home, you're pretty much seen every day by therapy. Nur um, nurse will be in uh, within the first you know, week, probably one or two times, but pretty much therapy is there for, um, for every day, for depending on, on the situation, but from, from one day to, um, to, to two weeks post-surgery. We usually plan for discharge of, of um, from home health into an outpatient. Sometimes patients are, are ready to go within four days. Sometimes patients need uh, more, more therapy. We have some patients that actually go right from the surgical center right to outpatient therapy. So um, it, it, it's, uh, it all depends on the patient, but it's typically uh, within two weeks uh, patients are out of their homes and ready to go. And also the nice thing about home health is, is that we also have a service occupational therapy and, that, and that's where they will help you with um, other needs. So it's kind of the differences between physical therapy and occupational therapy. Physical therapy works on your strength, 
works on your range of motion, works on your walking, your gait, your balance, your mobility. We, you know, we, we help with the home safety. We help with pain management in your home. We help with the, you know, the DEMA control. Uh, so we're, we're really there for that, the therapist as well as the nurses. And the occupational therapy, um, a lot of them for the total hips, you know, they uh, need to work on, on um, giving you sock aids and shoehorns because of the, some of the hip, you know, more of the hip precautions. They work on kind of working on everyday things, getting you back to cooking, getting you back to cleaning, all those fun things that we don't want to do, um, and bathing. So, so the occupational therapist can, can, can help with that. And then once you're ready with uh, and you're discharged and you're ready to go, the next step, what's the next step? We go dancing. But no, the next step is going to outpatient therapy. So like I said, within four days to two weeks, you're ready to go to outpatient therapy. Um, we have a uh, therapy center right here at, at, at our uh, 20, 27 Governor Street, the Rehabilitation and Wellness Center. Uh, so we're able to make a smooth transition, but you can go to you know, whichever outpatient center um, that, that you that you would like, um, but typically in many outpatient centers, uh, you know we you know you do strengthening the same things that you do in the home, but you just kind of do it a little bit more intense in um, the outpatient center. You're working on range of motion, which is very important. Working on your gait, work on your balance, your stretching, um, manual therapy modalities, which can can consist of heat, cold. Uh, um, kinesio taping. We work on a home exercise program so to continue what you've learned in your your home care. You can, can do an outpatient and then we kind of step it up and and add uh, more to that. The exercises are so, so important, especially with the total knee replacement that it continues. We want to keep that mobility and range of motion going. And typically with outpatient, you know, again, you're there two to three times a week, anywhere from four to six weeks. Some are longer, some are shorter, uh, but that's kind of the, the general um, um, things we could also do in, in the time of the pandemic. We're able to do telehealth visits, which are really nice, so we can kind of guide you through exercises. We could also do that in home care as well, um, which kind of helps guide you, guide you through uh, exercises. Um, and I think that was it. So. That's wonderful. Well, we do have uh, quite a few questions here. So I don't know whether uh, Dr. Dunleavy wants to turn on his video again and we can bring him back to the presentation. Um, so there's one for you here, Gigi. What type of exercises are good for knee problems in particular? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, again, anything that, um, it, if, if, if they're having pain with weight bearing, you have to be careful with doing weight bearing um, exercises. So, um, you know, if you're, if, if you're having issues, you could do non weight bearing things, even like swimming uh, is great for someone that, that if, if it's a truly arthritic uh, issue, but um, you can, if you have any if questions specifically, you could always email me and I can, I can um, answer them. But there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, open chain exercises. There's a lot of things that we can direct you, um, but we really need to kind of figure out what's causing the pain and, and that way we can like direct your, your uh, exercises. So I can't just give you a general idea. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and do you know how long a shoulder replacement might last? Someone has a question here. Um, I, I don't do shoulder replacements. I'll just start by saying that, but um, I, I am somewhat familiar and I, I think that uh, they're intended probably to last in the order of about 15, 20 years. I, I don't know that the data is quite the same as for hip and knee replacements, but I um, you know, I, if somebody asked me that in my office, I would refer them to one of my partners who, uh, who performed that operation. Um, the thing is those tend to be done um, a lot of times in really elderly folks um, for, you know, the, after they've broken a shoulder or really developed terrible arthritis. So I think the answer is probably um, that it's probably about 15 years or so is a reasonable thing to say. Okay, thank you. Um, when choosing a surgeon for hip replacement, what criteria should we ask to determine that the surgeon is the right choice? Yeah, um, 
I mean, I think the first thing is you want to make sure you have someone who does it for a living that doesn't just sort of dabble in it because uh, and when I say dabble, I mean, you know, does fewer than maybe 40 uh, a year um, because that's there are a lot of a lot of doctors out there, orthopedic surgeons who do joint replacements, but uh, it isn't necessarily um, their specific niche. And uh, one way of of finding out if if uh, a particular doctor, um, you know, is certainly to ask them how many they do a year. Um, I think you'd be looking for at least 50 minimum. Um, but also you can look for someone who is uh, board certified and specifically someone who uh, has done what's called a, a fellowship in, um, in joint replacement. And also you'll see it uh, referred to as a reconstructive surgery or adult reconstruction. Um, so for instance, in Danbury, uh, I'm one of uh, three doctors um, who does uh, have those sort of qualifications. Um, but that, those would, that would be a good way of starting. And then of course you want to sit there with them, with that doctor and make sure you're comfortable and you have a good rapport because that's actually also very important. Okay, great. And how long is a hip replacement surgery? Um, most of them about, about an hour and 15 minutes. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and Dr. Dunleavy, can you talk a bit more about medical appropriateness of candidates in particular for knee surgery? Are there BMI constraints? for example, or if someone has heart issues, would that be an issue? Yeah, so yes, there, not everyone is appropriate. Um, the, there are constraints and um, constraints involving um, ongoing medical conditions, especially conditions involving the heart and the, and the lungs uh, would be the most worrisome. And so you, you do need to uh, obtain medical clearance, typically from your primary provider before we would be able to proceed. And I, I refer to that as the light, the light turning green. We can't go forward with the surgery until we're sure that it's reasonably safe from a medical point of view. But um, the, the two criteria that I would point out, uh, BMI or body mass index um, is um, something as it increases as, um, and that would increase with people getting either shorter or heavier or a combination of the two um, there is an added risk uh, as that number increases. Uh, so there are certain surgeons who will simply refuse to operate on patients above a certain point. And I, I think that's a little bit controversial, to be honest. Um, I think that um, every case should be looked at individually, and that's how I do it. Um, but uh, not everyone will do that. And um, the only other one I'd like to mention is in folks who are diabetic in particular, um, a, having an appropriate uh, level of what's called the hemoglobin A1C, which is a, uh, a blood test that's done to measure how well or how poorly controlled uh, the diabetes is, uh, that number needs to be low enough uh, where we would consider it safe. In other words, uh, uh, any, certainly anything less than a seven uh, would be good, but uh, anything above an eight would not be acceptable. We just, we just simply can't proceed in that scenario. Uh, so those would be the ones I would, I would mention um, at this point, but there are more. Okay, thank you. Um, and what is the decision process by the surgeon to determine partial or full hip replacement? Uh, yeah, so uh, partial hip replacement is done almost exclusively in a scenario where someone has just fractured their hip, which is, you know, not something that, you know, is, is going to be handled in an outpatient setting. That's going to be somebody, you know, falls, unfortunately breaks their hip and requires a hip replacement um, to handle that problem. And, and uh, for somebody, uh, again, usually very elderly and not uh, particularly high functioning. And I, I'm, at this point, I'm usually just doing that for people beyond the age of 85 years old or with significant dementia um, who've broken hip, you would not do that to treat degenerative arthritis. Those would all be hip replacements, total hip replacements. Okay, and I think you've answered this one before, but how often would the surgeon have to perform surgery again after already replacing a joint? Yeah, the rate of, the rate of revision. Uh, uh, well, I think, you know, it certainly happens. It's rare enough um, 
And uh, I, I think that the overall rate of revisions will probably increase. And the reason for that is so many of these joints are being done and eventually they will wear out. So especially these days when patients are having these surgeries done in their 40s and 50s, you know, I am telling the patient to be prepared that they will need a revision at some point. They, sh they likely will need a revision at some point. Uh, they, they may not. Um, I think in my practice, I would say my practice, probably about 10% of my practice are revision surgeries only. Um, the busiest revision doctor I ever heard of was someone who focused his practice on doing these things, and he did about 80%, but he was someone at a major academic center who patients were referred into. So it's still, uh, you know, the minority of the surgeries that we do. I don't know if Gigi has uh, uh, any experience, you know, with seeing revision patients and how often, she, you know, the RVNA sees those patients. Yeah, we don't see a ton of them either. Probably um, one or two every six months. Yeah. Okay, and does waiting for surgery while participating in alternatives like injections and therapy cause any further degradation of the hip joint? Well, the answer is technically yes, uh, because every step you take, there's some degree of degradation that happens. But um, I always tell patients, that you're not going to really burn bridges, so to speak, um, until you start to notice a loss of motion. Uh, and that, that's usually uh, a pretty good indication that it's time to, it's time to you know, pull the trigger and do something. And the other, the other um, uh, sort of um, helpful um, symptom, I suppose, or if something, if a patient starts to become unsteady on their feet and is at risk for falling down, then that's also, that's the closest I'll come to telling them they really should do the surgery. Um, very careful to, tell patients, you know, this is elective, this is your decision. But once that starts to happen and they're at risk for hurting themselves, then, you know, you should, they should think about it carefully. And, and uh, you know, sometimes patients come to the clinic hoping to um, get therapy. And like we said, it, um, it will prolong it. But a lot of times we help them make the decision because once they've had the, the course of therapy and we see that they're not improving or that they're still having the same pain, that's when we refer them back to the physician and say, I think it's time, you know? And, and a lot of times they're, they're, they're happy to hear that, that we're all in agreement because they try to prolong uh, to a certain, you know, they wanna wait another month or two or even six months, but at some point it comes to where, where we always say to the patient, you'll know when because you can't sleep or you can't, you know, you, they'll, they'll, a lot of people get to that point and it might be a little bit too late. So we try to encourage before they really get to like what, what Dr. Dunleavy said before they really lose that range of motion. Okay, great. And uh, what type of complications can occur from hip replacement surgery? Um, there are many. Um, the, the most concerning uh, typically is an infection infection is, is just a it's just a disaster when that happens it, it, you know we we have uh, means for dealing with it but in all honesty it, it really is a disaster it's, it's awful when that happens so uh, we're you know pleased that the infection rate is very low it's uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of one percent um, and uh, one of the reasons as Gigi mentioned uh, to seriously consider um, if possible uh, outpatient and, and also um, outpatient surgery and, avo and avoiding nursing facilities if we can, because there, I think it is reasonable to say there'd be a lower risk of that, although not zero. Um, and also with hip replacements, uh, you will worry about the bone, um, one of the bones breaking, a fracture occurring uh, or the ball of uh, the ball and socket joint potentially popping out of the socket, uh, which is known as dislocation when that happens. And um, those, those can all happen. Um, but honestly, the, the worst is, in, is the infection happening. Okay, great. Um, and thoughts on a, on a double total knee? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask Gigi to chime in on this in a second. I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. I've done it. Um, several times, many times, um, I try to discourage patients from it just because it's, it's, 
very difficult, in my experience, it's, it's been very difficult for patients to do the rehabilitation effectively. Um, and that's the reason. It usually is reasonably safe if somebody is healthy enough. But I just, they just have such a hard time uh, with the rehab that I discourage it. So I don't know what Gigi thinks about that. Yeah, uh, the rehab is, is, is definitely uh, harder because um, I think what we found a lot of times patients uh, choose to do the double knee, knee or because they feel like once they, they won't go back. Um, but actually that's not the case. That's in their, what they think in their head. We've, uh, some patients that need both knees done, um, I think they're, it's actually more successful when they do it like a month or two apart. Like they have the one knee done and then they kind of get their rehab and then that's their good knee and then they go back and they get the other knee done. So it seems like that seems to be the most successful when you actually need both of them done uh, right away. I don't know if you, you find that too. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I'll just sort of as a follow up, I agree with that. Uh, that's why I, um, you know, I had somebody just today who uh, we did a knee um, six weeks ago and she, now she wants the other one. And because she's doing well enough with the first one, you know, we're going to go ahead and do the second one. Um, yes, it's two trips to the operating room, whereas both together is just one. And, and certainly that is a real uh, benefit to just have to go once, but it, you know, not if it means it's going to be that much tougher on someone. So that's, that's why I discourage it. But, uh, it, is, it is done. It is fairly common, actually. Okay, great. And someone is asking, do you operate from the front of the leg? Uh, in, uh, they're probably talking about hips. So, so. Um, yeah, there are several different approaches to, uh, to a hip replacement. Uh, there's some from the front, from the side, from the back. I do, I do all of them. Although I would say I, I most often will do what's called a uh, mini posterolateral lateral approach. Uh, that's the approach that I, I found is sort of um, most user friendly, especially with the robotic technology that we've now um, really adopted. Um, but uh, you know, there, there are uh, upsides and, and negative aspects to each and every one of those approaches. And, at the end of the day, whether we do it anterior or through one of the other uh, techniques, the pieces that go in uh, end up in the same place. And there isn't any long-term difference. There are short-term differences. Uh, so I suppose the short answer is yes, uh, but not as much as some of the other techniques. Okay, and I think you touched on this before, but someone is asking for a younger patient requiring a hip replacement in their 40s or 50s, say, who would likely need a second replacement in their lifetime. Can you speak a little more about this issue, how successful they are and how to navigate this? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I certainly wouldn't tell the patient, you know, that, oh, you need to wait longer because you're too young. I mean, if they need it at that point in their life, then they need it. And then if, if the day comes, not when, but if the day comes when uh, a revision procedure uh, is necessary, then, you know, there's every reason to think that that procedure would be very successful. Um, you know, we do them all the time and, and uh, they, are, they are a little more difficult in many cases, but no, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't discourage the, the patient from moving forward, you know, because, you know, their, their problem is, is most relevant right now and they, they need to, you know, they need to deal with the problem in front of them now and we sort of will cross that bridge if and when we come to it. Okay, great. Um, and is there a limit to how old one can be to get hip surgery? Not, not that I've encountered, no. Um, so I, uh, I, the oldest patient I've done a hip replacement for was, I believe, 105. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, now that was, I'll grant you, that was not elective. That was, oh. she fell and broke her hip. But, um, you know, she did, she did fine. Uh, after that, she did pretty well, actually. Uh, the oldest elective patient, I believe, was 97, I want to say, 97. Um, and it was because she um, could no longer remain independent the way she wanted. And she simply, it's actually a really good example of, of somebody saying to me, you know, doctor, I just am not okay the way I am. I understand, she said to me, I understand there are risks and I, I feel like I don't want to live this way. I want the surgery. And we did it. And luckily she did very well. Um, 
Uh, but uh, there isn't really an upper age limit, I suppose. Yeah, okay. Um, is there ever a time when it's too late and you cannot have hip or knee surgery if you have nearly complete loss of range of motion? Um, well, it's, it's never, it's never, there's never a situation where you can't do it. Sometimes it can be um, so severe that the, uh, it's much, much more difficult both to do the surgery and also the, the rehabilitation afterwards is much more difficult. So this is kind of where Gigi and I were saying that, you know, it, you don't want to wait till you lose that range of motion because even though we may go and replace the joint, um, all of the surrounding tissues, the muscles, the tendons and everything will now have gotten used to the situation where it doesn't, the joint doesn't move. And so it takes a long time for them to sort of uh, adjust to the new normal and that's uh, it, it can make it much more difficult for patients yeah if you have the surgery you definitely want to go in as strong as you can go in and it makes the rehab much better much easier and, and, and with everything okay and i think we have time for one question here um so how much damage can occur with a good joint if you know that you will need surgery eventually oh um I, I see what you know, what they're asking. I, I think um, you will tend to overload the opposite side. That's that's natural, and a lot of times um, the degenerative change will be bilateral to a certain extent. Usually, one knee or one hip is a little farther along than the other. Um, so I would say that you know I would usually tell patients, okay, so your left knee is a nine on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is the worst, and the, the other knee is a five. So it's probably you know a few years behind, uh, but we may get there eventually just to give them an idea. Uh, but they, you know, it's certainly very common for the other joint to eventually wear down also. And with, with the therapy with someone in that case, you know, a lot of times then we call the operated, operated knee the, the good knee because they tend to, um, Get, get so strong on the on their new knee that that's now their good their good knee, um, and and then it helps alleviate some of the strain from their opposite knee. Okay, wonderful. Well, that's all the questions that we have. Is there anything else you guys want to add before we end here this evening? I appreciate the uh, invitation. Yep. Thank you. Wonderful. And thank you everyone for taking part in the webinar. And I'm sure you got a lot out of it. So thank you and goodbye everyone. Okay. Good night. Thanks. Good night.